in some ways, she is an inspiration to me. I wrote her because she is an inspiration. She's a reminder to be, to me, to be forgiving. Welcome to our latest book reporter talk to interview where our guest today is Nita Prose. I loved her debut novel, The Maid, which is a Good Morning America book club uh, selection, the first one for the year for January. And it's also one of my first book reporter bets on selections of the year. I read this. I loved it. I couldn't wait to talk to her about it. So I'm so happy to have you with us today. Welcome, Nita. Oh, my goodness, Carol. It is so nice to speak with you. Thank you. I'm so excited about this book. So let's start because the audience doesn't know. Tell us about The Maid. Sure. Well, the maid features Molly, who is a socially awkward hotel room maid, whose world just gets turned upside down when she stumbles across an infamous guest, very dead, like very, very dead in his hotel room bed. And, you know, it is, it's a murder mystery. It's a whodunit. But it's a whodunit that can only be solved through a connection to the human heart. Mm -hmm. So heart and murder don't often go together. But in this book, they do totally work together. So the idea from this book came to you in a rather interesting way. So tell us about that, because I just love the story. It's just, I, you know, I keep telling this story. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, this really happened. This is incredible. So a, a few years ago, in 2019, I was in London at the London Book Fair, actually. And uh, I was staying at a London area hotel. And I went out for a meeting and I came back in the morning and I opened the door to my hotel room and I completely startled the maid who was cleaning it. And I remember her like jumping back into a shadowy corner. And this is the entirely embarrassing part, Carol. She had in her hands my track pants, which of course, like a fool, I had left in a tangled mess on my bed. And I remember looking at her as she held my pants and thinking, what an intimate job and an invisible job it is to be a roommate. You know, mm -hmm. simply by cleaning my room every day, she knew so much about me, mm -hmm. but I knew nothing about her. So, you know, that's how it started. And, and you know, my day went on, uh, days passed, and I got on my plane ride home a few days later. I sat down and that's when it really came to me. I started to hear Molly, my protagonist's voice. It was clean, it was crisp, it was precise. And I, I didn't have any paper, so I grabbed a napkin from under my drink, and I started to write the prologue to the book in a single burst. And I tell you, Carol, I didn't even realize it then, but I'd just begun my debut novel. So it was the prologue you wrote first. That was going to be my question, because it's so there. It's like so complex. And I'm saying, like, that what could have been a first thought kind of a thing, for sure. Some people go back you know, and do the prologue later on. But it was like, this is my premise is set up like right here. It was like a delivery of voice. And it just came to me like that, like a bolt. Wow. And I, I, you know, just, I kind of grabbed it from the air and wrote it down. And yes, that was definitely, you know, before I knew anything else, I knew that voice. Yeah. And you know, I love the phrase, you don't see your maid, but she sees you. And I've thought about a lot of times when I'm in a hotel, usually if I'm there for a week, day one and two, I straighten before she comes in. <laughs> I put the things back in the drawer. I put everything away. And usually I'm at a trade show. And by day three, it's completely fallen apart. I don't care who knows what about me. Clothes are all over the floor. Shoes are like, you know, in all different places. And I'm just thinking that like, will this now it change my experience of being in a hotel on days three, four, and five? Because you really do think about this person who you usually walk past the cart in the hallway and maybe they have a name tag on or they don't and you nod at each other and that's it. And then that's you just right. keep on walking. That's right. And, you know, if you look deeper into that nod, sometimes you'll, you'll see a little hint of, of what they already know about you. And I think I got a little taste of that in that room that day when I startled that poor maid. So did Molly come to you fully formed or did you play around with her? Did you like, this is exactly the way she was or was it a game a little bit? No, I think, you know, while, while I say that prologue came to me the way it was, then it was really a discovery of what made her tick. Um, it was a discovery to figure out that she was a person in a state of grief who had a really peculiar um, sort of eccentric point of view on the world that was different, that was unique. Um, you know, I wanted to write 
a, a mystery that was about, you know, somebody who is the same as all of us and yet entirely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we never meet Gran, but she figures so strongly into the dialogue in Molly's head that we feel like we know her. She's so important to the story. Was she a character there from the start or did you do that so that Molly had somebody she was actually talking back and forth to? That there was a little bit of inner dialogue to explain Molly. Yeah, I knew from the beginning that this character, Molly, had suffered a loss and that that loss ran as a, a parallel subplot to the whodunit um, aspects of the book. Um, and very quickly, then I realized a lot about Gran very quickly. You know, my goal with Gran was to really try to see if I could give the reader a gift, mm -hmm. the gift of a matriarch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mother died about five years ago. She did not go gently. She died. She died of Alzheimer's. It was a, a very difficult struggle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while I was entirely aware while she was alive, how important and formative she was to me to have that kind of strong female figure in my life who just gave unconditional love the way grand does mm -hmm. you know losing her made me understand how lucky i was mm -hmm. and i hope that in in grand i deliver a little bit of that the power of of a very strong and loving woman to the reader mm -hmm. yeah and she knew that molly was different but by the same token she was giving molly skills all along the way to empower her and she was not saying, Molly, you're going to be this. She was very content with the way Molly is running her life, but also guiding her along the way on the right courses of things. Because it's almost like I felt like if she had the right social cues, even though they were these crazy social cues, she could at least not embarrass herself somewhere along the way, as far as doing something that was rude. She, and, and if anything, she's too polite. Yeah, absolutely. She is probably too polite. And yes, I think you're absolutely right that, that Gran teaches her so much about the world and how to be. And yet at the same time, the, the beauty of, of Gran is that she never turns Molly into something she isn't. She mm -hmm. honors who she is with her uniqueness and her view of the world and never tries to model her um, into something that is the same. Mm -hmm. And Molly's had things happen to her. She's had things, she's had damage happened to her and yes. someone has um ruined her trust but by the same token she still plunges on she still has like this uh Bran has helped her move along in the world instead of getting stymied by somebody doing something to you i don't want to give anything away but what people would have done to you somewhere along the way Yes. You know, um, before I was an editor, I work in the book industry, but before I was an editor, I worked for as a teacher for several years and I worked with special needs students and it was such an important time for me. And I learned so much from those high school kids. And I remember taking them out into the world and being just abjectly shocked at the amount of abuse they received mm -hmm. by the world. Mm -hmm. But what else, the other thing I learned, and this to me is the lesson that stuck, is how resilient they were, how adaptable, how forgiving, and how strong. Mm -hmm. So when I went to create Molly, you know, it was really important to me that the reader discover over time that, in fact, she's not so vulnerable mm -hmm. as she appears to be at the beginning. In mm -hmm. fact, she might be more of a lion than mm -hmm. a lamb. Mm -hmm. And she's going to actually call some shots later on where everybody else is saying, oh, this is this, this, this. And I just think it was so much fun for you. It must have been interesting to be writing through her eyes, especially having those other experiences and knowing what those kids have been up against and knowing that these are some of the same situations you're throwing Molly into. Some of the people in the cleaning crew are cruel. Some of the people yes. are not, but she just goes around them. She goes above them. And yeah, it's you know, and I think in some ways she is an inspiration to me. I wrote her because she is an inspiration. She's mm -hmm. a reminder to be, to me, to be forgiving, to, to, to let my best self lead, um, to not be downtrodden by, you know, the negative voices. And would we all had a Molly near us to, to remind us um, to behave more like her because she behaves with such dignity and grace.
Yeah, everything is just the handles. And, you know, I think that she would be a dream employee in many ways, in other ways, completely frustrating, because if something got a little bit out of line, it's like, no, okay, it's all right, we can let that slide. No, yes. we cannot let that slide. <laughs> Mister, this is the way things go. And it was, and I think the dialogue helps us to see her both ways of like, you know, what's going on, because we were, was it a challenge to write both views of her to make her seem sympathetic, but also to have her be this is the way things are. This is the way things are. And then people are so exasperated, especially when the gentleman at the hotel in charge. Yeah, I think that the great thing about writing is that you really embody the character. I mean, if you're writing in first person, my job is to go sit behind her eyes, to live inside her skin and to forget about the rest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once I really embodied that role as a writer, then that just guided me. And I didn't have to think so much um, about the niceties of, is this going too far? Is this not enough? How, you know, at least on the first couple of drafts. And then of course, after you write a full draft, you can step back and then look at your work a little bit more critically and think about the reader a bit more. Well, you know, I think in all the interviews I've done, and I've done hundreds, nobody has ever said to me, they went into the embody the character. And I think it's a very interesting way to have gone and do this. People were like in the head, in the mind, but you were really, you can feel it that you were inside her all over that page. And it makes such a difference instead of taking this view back of, and let's just do an a thriller. So-and-so is going to walk into the room. Instead, mm -hmm. you're walking into the room with her. Yeah. And I think that when you're talking to a writer, the difference is very big because yes. you're either observing or inside. Yes, yes. I mean, this is a book where I really wanted the reader to empathize. And in mm -hmm. order to have empathy, you have to live as. And that really is my hope that if, if I could do this, if I can step into Molly and truly understand her, maybe I can deliver that feeling to the reader. So the reader can also step inside her to see from her eyes, to live inside her skin, and then hopefully to live as her is to love her. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me think a lot about all these invisible service workers that are up against in our lives. We haven't been in a hotel in a while. Someday we'll be back in hotels. And when you think about people wearing name tags, and so many times I try to address people by the name on the name tag, because the name is there not just to write the person up, but to personalize yes. who this person actually is. And I think that we don't do that enough. We just sit there and say, it's the person who came in and cleaned the room. It's the, and that not, and it's not just leaving money. It's about having that connection of saying hi. And a lot of people walk past people in the hallway and never even say, like, how's your morning? Something like that. Yeah, exactly. No, I think uh, having a, a, a name so that a person isn't just a role, they aren't just the person who empties the trash is mm -hmm. so utterly important. And I think, you know, I think we've learned a lot in the past couple of years, especially how absolutely essential to the fabric of our society, the service workers are. Mm -hmm. We can't really do much without them. We mm -hmm. can't get to work, we will not be eating, and nothing will be clean, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, I hope that, um, that, I, that I honored the service worker through the example of the maid, but of course she is just one service worker among, you know, thousands of kinds of service workers that exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. And you don't know who delivers your mail. You don't know. I mean, at the holidays, we figured out what everybody's name was. I have this thing with our UPS driver. I try to get down the stairs, give him a bottle of water before he hits the driveway and gets back up the driveway. <laughs> it's very, it's like a race sometimes. And he goes, haven't seen you in a couple of days. I said, conference calls, conference calls. It's been very, very busy. But to ask these people, like, what's your name? You've been delivering our house for 20 years. What is your name? Like, who are you? And find out a little bit about them. What I find is that sometimes the Thing gets walked down the driveway and put in like a special place or whatever because it's that mutual respect going back and forth yes. and i think that that's what we will, we also want to be able to do yes but of course then we do have like the villainous people as well i mean mm. we definitely have that and we've got charles black or should i say mr black and he was the kind of character that um could have one great backstory uh, with many wanting him dead like many many reasons was he a really fun character to create? Because Mr. Black, even his name being Mr. Black was just like such a, <laughs> okay, Mr. Black or Mr. White? You know, it, was, it did not pass my eyes that like, you know, that's what happened. <laughs> well, let me just say, you know, we, we opened the book knowing that very soon after the first few pages that Mr. Black is dead. And I don't think there will be a single reader out there who really cares if Mr. Black is dead. <laughs> Let's just say he ain't a great guy. And as we, um, you know, discover, as we move through the book, he really, really ain't a great guy. 
Um, and I guess there was some fun in that, definitely playing with the archetype of, um, you know, the, the evil magnate. But there's another piece of him too, you know, he, he's capable of some very, very nasty, awful mm -hmm. behavior, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. towards women. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that comes to the fore later on. And we discover that, you know, maybe there's a darkness that's happening in this posh hotel, in the Regency Grand Hotel that seems to be so elegant and luxurious and art deco and five star. But in fact, there's so much blackness, so much darkness um, mm -hmm. that's going on behind these closed doors. And he plays games. He plays games with his new wife. He plays games with his ex-wife. He plays games with everybody. He is a true power kind of monger kind of a person who manipulates whatever he wants and withholds and whatever. And you, you see him very, very quickly. You drew him very, very quickly on the page. But I love his wife, who's got this relationship with Molly that's like, you know, here, try my makeup. Here, look at how cute this would look on you, which just says so much about her at the same time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Giselle, I have to say, was a whole lot of fun for me to write. And it's been so interesting, uh, you know, hearing readers' responses to Giselle. Some people really dislike her, mm. which I can understand. Mm. And other people like her. And I love Giselle. I actually have a lot of sympathy for her. She doesn't always do good. She doesn't always make great choices. No, no. But she tries. She doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't mean to make the wrong choices or to hurt people. And yet sometimes she does. And yet she's also very much advocating for herself at the same time with him. Like if she's going to spend time with him and he's not always kind to her, she's going to make sure I want this thing. I want this thing. I want this other thing. So she makes sure she has things, even if she doesn't have the other part. It's um, she's done that different kind of transaction in life to make herself happy. Yes. And, but she chooses, she will, mm -hmm. she chooses who she's going to take from, who she's going to be transactional with. And, you know, we learn in the end that she, she, she regrets some of the choices she made and she tries to rectify that, mm -hmm. you know, because she's gotten so in the bad habit of using people that sometimes she uses the wrong people. And yet in the end, she tries to fix it. She tries to fix it. And you just love that. And you love that coda because the book's got a couple of codas on the end of it. Like you think it's ending and then, and then, and I really love that part. <laughs> I really love that. Was there a hotel you had in mind when you wrote about the Regency Grand? I know you were in Toronto and I was thinking of those two posh hotels that are downtown. Yes. I can't remember. They're good Victorian. And the, oh, I can't there's remember the Royal are. York, which yes. yes, definitely was sort of on the pastiche list of hotels that inspired me. I wouldn't say there's a single hotel. It's sort of you know, three or four hotels and then some, you know, very creative painting in my own mind to build the Regency Grand Hotel. Um, but what interests me about the whole hotel thing is the facade, how a, a, a hotel, like some people, can have two faces. It can have the outs, out, outside, the outer facing um, beauty and panache and elegance and yet when we get into the hotel, we start to see that that really isn't the truth. There's something else going on. And of mm -hmm. course, hotels also have that upstairs, downstairs sensibility. There's, you know, the gorgeous, um, you know, aspects that are meant for the guest. But the workers are so often toiling away in these back rooms that are entirely different, that are sweaty and hot and cramped with fluorescent lights. And so, you know, I'm very interested in that stark difference between what a hotel can mean for the guest, the illusion, and what it is in reality for the workers who mm -hmm. work there every day. I agree. I um, used to do, I used to work at Condé Nast years ago, and we used to do sales conferences in very beautiful hotels around the country. If you really want to see what happens at a hotel, run an event and they get you into the kitchen and they get you into all these places. And you're constantly trying to get them to do what you want them to do, like move these bags and do this, that, the other thing. And at the same time, they are trying to help you, but then they get exasperated by you. And I remember one time they sent us to the airport in a very posh car. And I turned to the girl who was with me and the woman who was with me. And I said to her, I just want you to know, this is so we don't come back. And if our <laughs> flight is canceled, we can't go back. So we get to the airport in the Bahamas and this posh car has dropped us off with our stuff with, I'm sure a sign of like, 
if they forgot something, we'll FedEx it to them. Like we don't want them back. And we get to the airport and the flight is canceled. And oh, no. as we can go back to the hotel. I go, oh, not me. I mean, we're not going back to the hotel. I remember I plunked down my credit card and I go, just put everybody on this other airline. Like, I don't care. We just can't. And it was this very funny view of what it's like to be in a hotel like that. Because when you see the other side, and they're telling you, oh, we can't do dinner like that. And meanwhile, on the front side, it's like, oh, everything's accommodating. Run a meeting and you have a totally different view of the back side of the hotel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like you've had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> it still makes me laugh when I still think about that very posh car driving us. And I'm like, you know, da, 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 da. So what intrigued you about writing this locked room mystery? Because a lot of rooms, it is, it's got a lot of, of the charm of that locked room mystery. Yes. Well, containment is a gift for any writer. You know, mm -hmm. I could be bound in a nuts shell and consider myself the king of infinite space. I need to be, as a writer, bound in a nutshell. And so the lock room mystery for me is such, uh, such a pleasure because it creates a sense of boundary. You know, the, the great master of this genre, of course, is Agatha Christie. And, you know, Murder on the Orient Express is a great example of how when you tighten the space, when you make the enclosure incredibly claustrophobic, then character can actually get bigger when the space is smaller. And so that for me was something I really wanted to explore in the Regency Grand, you know? There's a set number of floors, there's a set number of elevators, there's a set number of ways of in and out, mm -hmm. a set number of people that are involved, and that's basically where your cast of characters is gonna be. Yep. And where you so draw your surprises is from there. That's right. So everything else has to um, lend itself to some creativity. And of course, there's the extra challenge of this is a genre. Mm -hmm. It is something trod. Many people have done this before. So how are you going to make it new? Mm -hmm. Have you always been a fan of the genre? Has this been uh, one of your favorites? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I am a voracious reader. I read pretty much anything. If you put a cereal box in front of me, I will pick it up and read everything on it. I can't help it. So, you know, I love mysteries, but certainly not, you know, the only genre I love. Um, but what excites me about any genre mystery, that's certainly true, are there are rules, right? There are, as I say, there are boundaries. And so the fun of it is, what, what rules can I take and abide by? And which ones can I break? Mm. That is just, for a writer, that is just so much fun. So how long did it take you to do this first draft of trying to break those rules and then pull some back? How long did that take? So, okay. So th there's the answer and then there's the other answer. So from the first day I started that story, as I said, on the plane. On the napkin. Um, yeah. So to the last day when I finished those final words, it took me about five months to write the draft. Wow. However... <laughs> I have worked in the book publishing industry, you know, for well over 15 years. I work with writing and writers every single day. I've been a ghostwriter myself. I support all kinds of novels and novelists. And I have to say it is because of them, because they have allowed me into their stories and their worlds and their shaping that I was able to write, um, write this novel that quickly to know the craft of how to do that, do it. Did you outline in advance or did you just, you did it? I'm a big outliner, mm -hmm. big outliner. Now, and when I say that, uh, it means I know where I'm driving to. I just don't know how I'm going to get there. Mm -hmm. So you I, you know, the you knew the yeah, ending. I know the ending. I know the twists. I know formative scenes. The question is, how am I going to get there? And so that, that question ends up being sort of an engine that drives me forward. If that makes that sense. From, from there. Yeah. So how close is to what? you first wrote to what readers are reading now? How close fair, are we? Fairly close, but I would say, you know, some of some of the, yeah, I mean, the twists were all the same um, and the characters are all the same. I don't think there was a single character who um, changed, but there, you know, uh, because I wrote so quickly, I had to deepen. A lot of the work that um, I did with my editors um, after that first draft was about deepening. It was about understanding how to give the reader enough so that mm -hmm. they could participate in the rest of the, the, the drawing of place mm -hmm. and character, mm -hmm. but not give them too much. And mm -hmm. I, you know, what I learned from that, because I've never been on the other side before, right? I've always been the editor telling the author what to do, not vice versa. What I learned from that is that I need to put more on the page. I mm -hmm. tend to go a little too spare and the reader needs a little bit more. 
right it's in your head but not there it's that's like, right oh, i see that you don't see that okay that's, i don't yeah get yeah okay all right so i need to do more detailing um so mm -hmm. there was a lot of that work done and if i remember correctly you had more than one editor you had three editors you had uk canada us how did that work? Did they all read and give you one set of notes? Did you get three sets of notes? How did that work? Because I find they, that so interesting. It is. It's not uncommon in our industry. Um, and I got one set of notes, which was great. And the beauty about these three particular editors, Charlotte Brabin in the UK, Nicole Wynn Stanley in Canada, and Hilary Tiemann at Ballantyne in the US, is that they really cooperated. And we all shared a goal. Mm -hmm. uh, about what we wanted for this book. And so, you know, Charlotte really concentrated on detail of place and, and made sure that I, I, I delivered that hotel fully on the page and that the reader could see it. And Nicole was all about, eh, that little snippet of dialogue doesn't work. And Hillary, mm, I know what you're trying to do here, but it, 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 you haven't nailed it yet. And this moment relates to these four moments. So can you think about that as a total arc again? So my goodness, I was in such incredible hands with these three women. And I tell you, Carol, and your, your listeners probably know this, it takes a village to publish a book. This mm -hmm. idea of the novelist that descends, you know, like the child of Zeus fully formed from his head, it's not true. Um, you know, it takes a whole village to create a book and to publish it well. And I'm so grateful, um, not just for the role that my editors played in the development of this novel, but you know, for all of the um, great number of people who have supported this publication. Yeah, and you know, it's it, there's a super enthusiasm for the book as well, and rightly so, but it's also sometimes there are too many hands get in it. There are too many passes on a book, and sometimes it just loses its boom. It's, it just loses, yes. and, the, and you, this, does, this doesn't happen for a second here, but you know what I'm talking about, where I do. we're trying yes. to get it. We're trying to get it. We're trying to get it. We didn't get it. And now we have six different things that we're trying to make into the seventh. And you feel like there's somebody that objective needs to come in at this point and just give it a pass and go, let's just look at this again. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that can happen. And that's why I feel so tremendously lucky and grateful that my editorial team and my publishing teams had a singular vision, the same vision that we developed together and that we owned and honed together. And yeah. you're right. That doesn't always happen. No, that doesn't always happen. I have to say, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> a lot of infighting, a lot of, oh, this, this, this. Yeah. There's so many different, I think if readers understood how many different characters there are involved in this, they're the agent, the author, the, uh, you know, just so many different players and so many different visions of also when a book is bought, when it's going on a list, that list may change and how they want that book to change to work on that list. And it's all these like unforeseen factors that could factor into a book working or not. And this one was really just this complete like kismet kind of thing coming together. And I really love the quote you used at the end. And I actually have this framed in my office. It's life has a way of sorting itself out. Everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And I love that. And when I saw that at the end, I was like, wow, I've got that framed on my wall. So is it a favorite quote of yours? It is. It is. Um, I, I find it gives me a lot of peace, that quote. Mm -hmm. um, it's a reminder um, that life is long, that it's a roller coaster. Um, it's not about the highs or the lows. It's about the ride. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the funny thing about that, like you're saying that you have this quote on your wall, obviously gives you solace as well. When I was searching for an agent, the agent that I wanted the most was Madeline Milburn out of the UK. And she um, is the first supporter of Eleanor Oliphant is completely mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. She understood before the rest of the world, like me, readers like me caught up, you know, that, that uplit existed, you know, uplifting literature, this tag that the, the UK uses for it, or feel good fiction, as we call it in North America, mm -hmm. you know, is incredibly powerful, because it is that story that can, that can really deliver a journey of the spirit, and that it can be hopeful. When I finally put my big girl boots on, and I submitted my manuscript to her, because of course, I was abjectly terrified and was certain that I'd written a piece of junk, but eventually I did submit it to her thinking, oh my God, this is brutal. And, you know, waited agonizingly for days for, the, for a response. And of course, in my head, the only response I was going to receive was, 
oh, uh, it's really lovely, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass. And we all know what that means. <laughs> However, the email came in from Maddie and she liked it. She loved my book, in fact. And at the end, she said, P.S., you're not going to believe this, but I'm staying at a friend's right house right now because our house is being renovated. And on the wall right behind me is that quote. Oh. It's in a frame. So when I was reading and got to the end, I completely gasped and I couldn't believe it. And then, of course, she sent me a photo of, of the, um, the picture on the wall with that quote. I love it. And, uh, you know, there's sometimes a little bit of kismet and magic in this crazy industry. And um, that was a, a moment that I'll never forget. Yeah, I remember I just looked at that and I was like, oh, I love that line. I absolutely love that line. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So speaking of these like kismet moments happening. So what happens when Good Morning America calls and says, hey, you're the book club selection. How long ago was that? Okay, it's January. How long ago did you know? That was a long time ago. So I think it, I think it was in the summertime. Um, you keep, you keep that quiet too. Oh my time. goodness. I have been very diligent in my secret keeping skills. Let me just say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it was quite a moment, you know, uh, I, what can I say? It was, it was such a shock. I was so overjoyed. Um, you know, that's a book club that really moves the needle. They have an ability to put a book in front of so many readers and so many different kinds of readers. Mm -hmm. And I was just so excited. I still am. I am so excited. Now, when is your piece airing on GMA? It's actually airing tomorrow. So today is January 12th. It airs tomorrow, January 13th. And then, of course, it'll be posted for anybody who wants to see it. We'll include a link to it in our notes, a bit for both the podcast and the video, so people can watch you on GMA as well. Great. You know, it's funny, years ago, Tyari Jones was picked as um, an Oprah selection. And everybody'd say, What's happening? Book, nothing. What's going on? Nothing. Any, any pickup? No, no pickup whatsoever. She said, Because you can't say a word. So she said she was afraid to say anything. Her mother goes, Nothing's happening with your book. Nope, nothing's happening. And then, big surprise. So, yes, yeah, I was the same. Family and friends asking, How is it going? You know, any news? No news, nothing to say. Don't look over here. Let's change the subject. How are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, January is a great time to get picked too, because people are cocooning at home, especially now with everything that's going on with variants and whatever. People are cocooning at home and they're looking for, okay, what's my thing to do? And a lot of people say, I'm going to read going into the first, we're in our do good moments. I don't think anybody's talking about going to the gym this year. It's like, <laughs> what are the things that we're going to do? Reading, here's the book, this book, and it's, it's a succinctly describable book too. It's like, this is what happens. This is, and who has never been in a hotel and wanted to see the other side of it and want to know what goes on? Absolutely. Any people watcher, and I think most people are people watchers, will be fascinated with hearing the other side, seeing it's it. Just, it's just like that. So, okay, let's talk about your other hat. You're the vice president and editorial director of a publishing line in Canada. Did knowing about this publication process change like okay when you're looking for the agent you were like oh like I don't know what's going to happen did you have any more clarity because you've been spending years doing this of where it might go from there because we're going to talk about the journey of where this book goes from there which is pretty crazy so going in you've got some trepidation about who's going to say yes and then from there you've got some savvy about making deals you've got some savvy about sitting on the other side of the table what was it like to be there for that publication process well, um, you know, I have to say that I rested all control. Um, I wanted all control taken away from me at that point. It's like, well, this is the job of my agent now. Now I don't have for once, for once, I don't have to be a broker in a deal. I can just sit back and have my agent do it for me. So that was actually uh, unbelievably liberating. Um, to be, to be able to say, okay, I've got a great agent. It's an agent I trust. Absolutely. So now I can sit back and just enjoy this rather than being part of it. So it, it was quite liberating. In fact. <laughs> and yet somebody else advocating for you. If I don't really love the cover, she can say it, not me. I don't have to say anything that's, you know, this, that, the other thing, what's going on. How about, um, what has it been like for you as now thinking about your clients, thinking about the authors you're working with? Do you have a different appreciation for page proofs are due in three days or whatever you're passing along to them? 
You know, I really do. Um, maybe not so much in that context, but something that I've always talked about with my authors is I use the metaphor of a labyrinth. So, you know, as a writer, your job is to go into that labyrinth and you're going alone. Um, so you're, you're, you're going to head in and you're going to find that story. And you can't tell that if you turn left here and you do this narrative move, you might write for six months and come to a dead end. And that is why editors are so important because they're not in the labyrinth. They're outside of it on a very tall ladder and they can look down into it and say, honey, if you turn left there and you follow that story, you're going to get to a dead end. So don't do that. Really, I started to understand what that felt like, the vulnerability of being in front of the maze mm -hmm. and not knowing for once, not being able to have a sense of direction. How am I going to make it from here all the way to the end of that story without messing up? And so, you know, I've really taken that away with me. And that is something I will always just have a visceral understanding and memory of. And it's going to make me, I hope, in the future, a better, more sensitive editor. Yeah, because it's like, oh, wait, if I say this, this is what they think. Because a lot of times it's the way you deliver words. It's the way you say something that could either make somebody go, oh, I'm in the wrong. I'm right or wrong. And it's not really that. It's just going to be this collaborative. Let's get moving ahead. It's really yes. that, that kind of an experience. Yeah, it's really about here are the issues. Let us work together to solve them. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I love that your last name's a pseudonym and I love um, how did prose come about? Was that like immediately? It's Nita Prose. That's going to be my name. It was just a handle that I'd used for so long on Twitter and such that it was like, well, okay, I guess that's who I'll be as a writer. <laughs> I love it. I love it because I sat there and I was like, oh, there was a different name. Now, was the title always The Maid? Was that always this is what it was going to be? It was always The Maid. It was always yeah. The Maid. Yeah. And and this cover is really terrific. I'm trying to get it without glare. And was this the first pass of the U.S. cover or were there some other gyrations? There were some other other covers that we considered, um, but this is the cover where when I open this one up, I'm like, OK, that's the one. Um, I wanted the cover that um, had um, an old world sensibility and a new world sensibility at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. a nod to something conventional and to something new. And um, that Art Deco flavor here, the way we can look through the keyhole, but we can't see entirely what's going on. Um, I just could not be happier with this design. Yeah, you see somebody on the run. The way her- Yeah, there's a maid back there. Where's she going? She's, yeah, she's, she's, she's puffing she's it out quickly. of there. Her foot's yep. up, she's running. Her The tails on her apron are out there. Like what's going on? Now, I've got to look at the UK cover, which is completely different. And it's interesting when you go into different countries, let me put this here and make it easier. It's different countries have different covers. And I find that fascinating, which is just, it's, it's a brilliant cover as well. It's beautiful. So it's green, like a dark lush green with gold foil and gosh, you've got to love gold foil. Um, and there's a, um, a doorknob, sort of an art deco style uh, doorknob on the front and on it hangs a, one of those wonderful door hangers that you'd see in a hotel when you don't want the maid to come in and you say private keep out or I'm sleeping or whatever it is. However, on this door hanger is this beautiful paper art that was actually commissioned like this is a thing that's been made that looks like the Regency Grand and it's all finely detailed and that is what is hanging off of the doorknob. Um, I absolutely adore this cover um, as well. It's an entirely different look, an entirely different direction. Mm -hmm. And some of the details on the inside of the, of the UK cover are just absolutely oh. lush. They have gorgeous end papers. Yes, I am totally a book nerd. I am talking about end papers. Um, <laughs> they show the, um, the art that they made on the front of the Regency Grand Hotel in all its fine detail. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. So now I've, I've checked, I think the book has been sold into 33 countries the last time I checked. You might have more info, which is wonderful. How many of those have been published already or will you be getting copies from these 33 countries along the way for your wall? <laughs> it's going to be a really fun year because they kind of all staggeringly publish throughout the year. Um, I, I think a couple of territories um, have gone out already, and there's a couple more to come this month, next month, the month after. And it is so much fun, Carol, seeing these different cover designs that are, you know, some of them are just like, whoa, that is so different. And some of them are like, oh, this is an interpretation I never would have thought of, but I, I understand it. And you can tell a lot by the reader, about the readership by seeing those covers coming from different publishers. 
well, you know, we also build websites for authors. That's another thing of what we do. And oh, wow. we put up all the covers. It is so much fun on the page. Oh, I will. What we'll do is we'll put up like, you know, let's say the Ukraine's not here yet. So you just put up with a question mark and yeah. then you go and you do this. And it's so much fun to sit there and see what's coming, what's not there. And you realize the long life in publishing it's here. And you just think hardcover paperback, but UK, Canada, everything may be on totally different publication schedules and which keeps you touring for a very long time, virtually or whatever, but very, very interesting to see. And also the interpretations I just love and the way the titles like in different languages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that that part of the publishing industry is just so much fun. Well, the other one that's really exploded is audio. And you've got Lauren Ambrose is the narrator. Did, now she's narrator in US. Did you have a hand in selecting her? Did you listen to different tapes? And are you an audio listener besides listening to tapes of what, who you wanted? I listen to a little bit of audio, but you know, I must say, as I said before, I am a true book nerd. I like that print copy. Oh, yes, I do. Um, but you know, there are all kinds of moments where you can't sit and read and audiobooks are so fantastic for that, especially when you're in the car. Um, and yes, I did have a hand. I got to um, choose between various uh, readers and I just felt like Lauren's voice had this certainty to it and a little crack a little crack in it where you just didn't quite know if you were getting the full character. And I love that, that quality in her and her, in her, in her, how she portrayed the role in the audiobook. Fantastic. No, oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. So it's also being adapted and universal as a feature film. What do you know about this so far? We're in early stages moving along. Where are we? Super excited. Um, I'm thrilled that Universal Pictures has taken it on. And of course, Florence Pugh is set to star as Molly. Florence, of course, starred in uh, Black Widow, in Midsummer, in Little Women. And uh, she's going to executive produce as well. So will I. And I am so looking forward to next steps. Things are moving along. I cannot talk about it, but your listeners need to know that right now I am smiling ear to ear as I say this. I cannot <laughs> wipe this smile off my face every time I talk about this. So um, we'll, we'll have to see what the future holds. Hopefully we will see this on the screen someday. Will you, are you shooting? Do you know where you're going to be shooting yet? Or is that also a secret? It's a, it's a question mark so yeah. far. Um, yeah. You know, in the book, I purposely am a little bit vague about this sense of place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people might think it's the US, other people might think it's the UK. And I wanted that sense of vagueness. I wanted the reader to have uh, a little bit of the feeling in terms of the setting that Molly does every time she walks out into the world every day because she knows the world so well, and yet something is going to come at her or someone is going to come at her that throws everything into a state of disorientation. Mm -hmm. um, so we will see what the movie makers uh, decide to do, whether they wanna set it in the UK or they wanna set it in the US, but I think those would be the major choices. And it'll be interesting to see also how they do the casting, but also how they interpret the story, because something will be interpre interpreted and see what they do and what see there's one way they can take it or there's another way or there's a third way or fourth way. And we'll do, we'll do that, not with just with the screenplay, but also with the characters and how they're embodying the, the storytelling. I just I can't wait for that part, because, you know, the the beauty of cinema and of film is that it creates that perfect picture. You know, I talked before about how as a writer, it's your job to give enough, but not give too much. You don't wanna complete the, the picture. You wanna give a few lines so that the reader can participate and build an image in their own mind. But on film, the, imagining the luxury that they can create on screen with the Regency Grand, I just cannot wait to eat it up. And you know what's really fun too is when you're on set, because you used to make documentaries, you do that pullback shot and you look in the room and there are all the cameras are in the room <laughs> and you're seeing this gorgeous shot. And then behind it is like the lunch truck. And it's like all this wire on the floor. It's sort of like when you go in and do Good Morning America, you're sitting on this very posh set and behind it is everything, these wires coming Chaos. down from the ceiling or whatever. And you're in this very like tight space, but all around you is... And I sometimes wonder how, as the actors can actually concentrate, because I'd be watching like what's going on over there or whatever. And instead you're just doing your thing right there. But these people are so close to you doing the other thing, holding the microphone above you or whatever. 
Yeah, and you have to pretend they're just not there. Yep, just that's a very there. tricky yeah, thing. Like, that person's intriguing over there. No, just watch <laughs> over here, Amy. That's exactly. all you will get is Amy, you know. So dare I ask what's next? Are you working on something else? I, you know, I'm actually working on a few things. So I don't really know what is going to come next. Um, it's going to be uh, as much of a mystery to me <laughs> as it is to everyone else. But yeah, I have you know, a few different ideas that I'm sort of working out in my mind. And I guess it's just a matter of what is the next best step. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can assure you that there are, there, there are things in the hopper. There's sophomore, your sophomore effort is definitely ready there. And maybe your junior and senior as well. I you hope know, so. I hope there. so. <laughs> It's been so much fun. It's like, it's just a tour de force, you know, first effort. And it's just so much fun to talk to somebody who's been in the business and understands the business so well, but also has gone on and created something that's fresh and exciting mm -hmm. and not the least, least little bit like, oh, I know how to do this. You are going into this with as much um, excitement as everybody else, even with the knowledge of what you have. And I think that's really to be appreciated. Oh, thank you so much, Carol. That means the world to me. So it's such a pleasure having you as a guest. We look forward to seeing you for the next book. Absolutely. I can't wait. That actually gives me an incentive to go write it. There we go. There we go. We're looking for that. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks 2.